now is uh, uh, Robert Melcher, and, and please introduce yourself, Robert. First, many thanks for for accepting to be here, and we appreciate very much that you are in Australia as Frank, and it's very late for you. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, it's nearly midnight over here, but I'm sure you're still enjoying a nice sunny afternoon wherever you are. Uh, it's been wonderful weather over here in the last few days, even though we've had lots of floods. I'm going to um, talk about things that are, would some people would argue are um, almost um, not to be mentioned because uh, I don't actually agree with the critical chloride content business at all. Uh, I do agree that we want high quality concretes, and that means high strength and long durability, both in the concrete and reinforcement. And the conventional wisdom is that the chlorides initiate reinforcement corrosion and that they promote long term reinforcement corrosion. And that they, the more chloride you have, the worse it is. However, I would argue there are many practical examples, and Frank's already mentioned one or two of them, that do not support the conventional wisdom. And if you go back and look at the history, of reinforced concrete and um, particularly exposures in marine environments. This has been known for a long time. And I'll just quote two references at the bottom of that page there. You can look them up both in the uh, uh, ACI proceedings. And they basically say, we can have fantastic concretes without any problems of reinforcement corrosion. In other cases, it's not the case. And the question then is what's going on? And going back to fundamental science, you have a hypothesis, and if you then find examples that don't fit, the chances are the hypothesis or the theory is wrong. And I think that's the thing we should take on board that maybe the thinking about critical chlorides is actually not correct. Now that's a pretty bold statement, but I think that's where we're at. So what I wanted to talk about today is some, some uh, very quickly some field evidence, and I can only give you a little bit of that, uh, some basic uh, issues that uh, need to be considered if you're going to look at corrosion of steel and concrete, and it must be consistent with basic thermodynamic principles. And I think sometimes we tend to forget that. We also need to look at the data that's available uh, when we are actually dealing with, if you like, real concrete rather than uh, solutions in, in artificial environments. Uh, and then I think we need to think about other factors that actually cause reinforcement corrosion. And one of them is very poor quality concrete, poor compaction, high permeability, and things like low cover. Because we tend to assume that somehow the cover is fantastic, but the more we look at it, cover is often a big problem because it's not uh, highly impermeable. It's, it's often poorly compacted. And there are other factors like alkali, aggregate reactions, permeability, rate of loss of alkalis, and deep cracking that I'll mention. Now, some of the cases, and nearly all of these we've reported about in, in other papers. So I'll, I'll not mention them, but there's one example on the top left-hand corner here, Mariah Island off the coast of Tasmania, 1923, this thing was built. You can go and have a look at it today and there's almost nothing wrong with it. There's just a little bit of reinforcement corrosion. Uh, Frank's been involved in these Navy pillboxes and forts in the Thames estuary. And most of those are still in pretty damn good condition. I looked at some concrete lighters that were used in, uh, for transporting things in, 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 in the Seven Estuary, built in the 1940s. You can go and look at them if you know where to find them. And there's almost no evidence of reinforcement corrosion. Um, the piles on the bottom left-hand side, Hornibrook Bridge was built in 1932. There were nearly 900 reinforced concrete piles driven to the ground. They were pulled out in 2002, and there's almost nothing wrong with them. And this is in the immersion zone, in the splash, in the tidal zone, and the splash zone, in the upper atmosphere, in the atmospheric zone to the top of the piles. What drove all of this was some work I did in in, in Scotland, in in Arbroath. In, I was actually staying at the University of Dundee, and I walked past these things in about 2004. You can see it's a long handrail on the North Sea coast, and I just thought this is crazy. These have been here for for many years, like 60 years, and there's virtually no evidence of reinforcement corrosion. Uh, and this is a local one right near where I live in Newcastle Beach here. There are concrete structures there that go back to the 1930s and it's hard to find reinforcement corrosion. So what's going on here? Probably the, the best case that I can pick is this one here, which is the um, 
Phoenix caissons that were built during the Second World War uh, in the UK. Uh, they were meant to be um, protection to um, wave action while they built the, um, the, the ports, the artificial harbours for Mulberry. And they were going to build two of them and they built 140, more than 140 caissons in about six months in the UK with unskilled labour, ordinary concretes at the time, they were added, water was allowed to be added. These things are big. They're 60 metres long, typically, up to 25 metres wide, up to three storeys high. You're talking about enormous concrete, reinforced concrete boxes with thin walls. They were meant to last for six months because that's all I thought they would need them for during the Second World War. There was no consideration given to durability. That wasn't an issue at all. All I wanted to do is build these things to protect, to build a protective harbour. And they did that. And most people think when they look at these now, and there are quite a few left still off the coast, that, oh, they're suffering from reinforcement corrosion. If you do your history, if you go back and look at the facts, they were damaged mainly by storms that occurred shortly after they were installed. And nearly all the damage you see, and I'll put one photo in the middle here showing the damage, it's storm damage. It's not reinforcement corrosion damage. Now, I was told about these many years ago, and there was nothing I could do. It was very difficult to get out there. But recently, in the last few years, we've been cooperating with the French, who were worried about their tourist attraction gradually corroding away. Because uh, a lot of people come and look at these things from the coast, and there's a lot of Americans and Canadians come to that coastline to look. Um, so they've commissioned a French co um, consulting company to investigate and to take cause. Now, all of that material we've now reported, you can see that the Institution of Civil Engineers in 2020, but in summary, we can say the chloride contents are extremely high. The concrete is of high strength, even though it was made very quickly, and there's almost no evidence of reinforcement corrosion, except where there were damages, as you can see in the bottom middle picture, and the bottom right hand picture where the concrete was damaged because of structural damage. And then the bar started to corrode. But there's almost no other evidence of reinforcement corrosion, except in the right hand picture, you can see something I'll refer to later on, which is corrosion between concrete pores. So this is just one example and there are lots of others. So let's look at some factors. The early reinforced concretes, and I've already mentioned some of these early papers, had no additives, just cement, sand, aggregates, and water. And in, initially, there was no limitation on how much water you could add. So that actually meant that you had good workability. If it didn't flow very well at concrete, they just added some more water. Vibrators, which we all think about as always existing, didn't exist prior to 1940. All that old concrete was hand rotted. And some examples that I can't talk about at the moment, but we've done with students, hand rotting is probably a more effective way of compacting concrete than any other method, including vibrators. Cement, there's been a lot of discussion that cement was somehow changed and it has been changed and that somehow affects reinforcement corrosion. We can't find any evidence of that at all. The, the, the basic product is still much the same. What did change in that period of time, we went from smooth bars to deformed bars and then there's ultimately some pre-stressing concrete bars. Uh, the cement content for the older structures is typically higher than now. I honestly don't think that's an issue in the whole durability bit. It is for strength, but not for durability. And we can talk about that at the end, if you like, because we have other examples where there's no cement. Um, added water for workability. Well, that was permitted. And the early concretes also allowed seawater to be used for making concretes. Now that's totally banned now, and it's banned on the basis of what I would call some pretty flimsy evidence in the 1960s. And it was basically driven by some American practice. But if you look at it, there's some old concretes around that were made with seawater and they're still doing fine. Thank you very much. So we have a long history of successful practical durability concretes and I will refer you to some, a couple of papers we have published in the ACI journal in 2019 and 20, where we actually looked at very serious tests that are now 20 years old, but at the time they were about, I think 14 or 15 years old when we reported uh, on them. 
and we used seawater in all of, in nearly all of those tests and nothing much happened. So the question really is, are chlorides important? And then you go back and say, well, where did the idea come from? Most of the current thinking is based on the Tutti model that says the inward diffusion of chlorides suddenly creates conditions and then active corrosion occurs or serious corrosion occurs. And the chloride content is what the thing we've been arguing about. And the wide scatter tells me, just looking at it from afar, if you like, if there's a lot of scatter, there's other things must be involved. Because if we really understood what was going on, we would be able to get the chloride content down pretty narrowly. And I heard, heard the other discussion about, oh, yeah, we do all different tests. Well, Frank's right, we should be then pulling all that other data apart. And then if we are correct in our assumptions, we should get very narrow uh, chlor critical chloride contents. But to me, it suggests that even uh, with what we know already, the scatter means other things are involved. Now, some basics. In the early days, there was a lot of electrochemical tests done when stirred solutions. And I think completely you should wipe all of those out because in pour waters, in concretes, around the steel, the waters are stagnant. And then we know from very early work, going back to 1908, that aggressive species, including chlorides and a whole lot of others, that play almost no part in corrosion in, in a wet environment. Now that was, uh, you can go and look up um, uh, some of the old texts and there was a lot of controversy about that, but go back and look at Mercer and Lombard in 1995, they repeat the tests and show exactly the same. If there's no um, movement of the waters, the chlorides and all the other aggressive species play almost no part in the corrosion because there's still water and oxygen and iron. They're the critical ingredients. The only problem with that is that these guys didn't actually look too closely at pitting. And it is possible to have localized or, or pitting in a localized area under high pH and high chloride conditions. And if you, you've got to go back and look at the original papers by Paul Bay, they make that point when he talks about pitting. And yet in the initiation process that we've been talking about so far, we basically don't actually think about pitting, but in fact, in my view, it's quite critical. So before I get to that, let's just have a think about how corrosion of steel in seawater without any concrete for the moment occurs. And again, we have to think about what actually happens rather than what most people think. Most people think oxygen controls everything. Well, it does for a while, but that's not the long-term picture. That's my mode one in there. And the rusts build up and eventually oxygen can't really get to the steel very, very well at all. And things change, you change to anaerobic conditions and then the hydrogen evolution reaction takes over. And if you don't believe me, go and look at a paper we've just had published with Robert Jeffrey in, two, in corrosion in 2022, where we lay out a long-term, very, very detailed arguments for that and experimental evidence that shows exactly this, this behavior. So it's not good enough just to think about oxygen. In the long term, oxygen isn't really relevant at all. And you can see there the uh, CSRS circle thing. That's the long term parameters. It's just a linear thing, and it doesn't really matter too much what happens early on. So I'm moving a little bit away from the from the topic of initiation, but we'll come back to that right now. The point is that we would expect corrosion of steel in concrete to at least be consistent with the basic idea of corrosion in seawater, because after all, we're talking about chlorides. Now, way back in 2019, 2009 or thereabouts, uh, 2006, we proposed this, this model that's on the top right-hand side there, where we said rather than a 2D model, we should have initiation. And if the concrete is really good, nothing much will happen after that. And it's only later on that we get active corrosion occurring. And we didn't really understand at that point in time why that red circle part should happen, but we do now. But as part of that process, we then went back and looked at all the data we could find for real structures in the literature, not experimental work in the laboratory, but actual structures, and looked at 
the estimated chloride content, which is on the bottom of those two graphs. Uh, and there's two different graphs, and one's for igneous aggregates, if you like, or siliceous aggregates, and the other one's for limestone aggregates. And there is a big difference, but I don't want to go there today. Uh, but the concept is the same. You have almost no effect of chloride content on the time to initiation, that's that blue circle thing, or the time to active corrosion. It takes longer, because the vertical axis is in time, but there's a lot of scatter, but there's not much effect of chloride content. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about igneous aggregates or limestone aggregates. We'll talk about limestone aggregates some other time. And the question then is why the scatter? Well, in 2004 or thereabouts, I decided to set up a whole series of tests with lots and lots of different water cement ratios, lots of aggregate cement ratios, build small samples and have one bar in each sample and then wait and see what happened. And it was one of those things academics can do. Uh, we still have a fair proportion of those samples left. They're still sitting corroding away happily. Well, they're not corroding away happily, most of them. Um, we made them with seawater. And then we found, after we started to get our heads around what was going on, we then took cross sections. This is relatively recently. And you can see on the top left hand picture that where there's an air void next to the bar, there is corrosion there. And if you look at the bar sideways, this is a very typical view. No corrosion on top of the bar and pitting along the bottom of the bar. Now, why should that be? It's a compaction issue. Almost invariably, the voids are at the bottom of the bars. And this has also been observed in practice. Now, the air voids provide the required oxygen and water. May not, they may not be completely filled with water, it doesn't matter. There's water in there, and water has usually got oxygen in it anyway. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any corrosion in seawater. And when that runs out, either the water or the oxygen or both, things stop. So the size of the air voids is immediately an, an issue. The bigger the air voids, the more corrosion you're going to have around the bars. And if you have very, very small air voids, in other words, very good compaction, you might get a little bit of corrosion, but you wouldn't get very much. And that's exactly what we saw for that bridge I mentioned before, where we had nearly 900 reinforced concrete piles. We opened those up and there was virtually no corrosion on any of the bars. But it was fantastic concrete. So for low permeability, welcome back to concrete, you get low initial corrosion and it increases. So you look at the, the bottom picture in the middle there, you can see this parameter uh, CSC, increasing size of voids as the concrete becomes less well compacted, if you like. For really good quality concrete, you get the green line. And then the question is what happens later on? But we're talking about initiation here and that's the bit there. So it depends on the void size and how well compacted the concrete is. And remember, these were all made with seawater. So they had very high chloride concentrations to begin with. Now, what's the mechanism? Well, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's diff essential, essentially differential aeration at the edges of the voids. And some of the early work by Angst and so on, and the whole committee in, in the European uh, area, we're expecting to see corrosion opposite the voids, but that doesn't make any sense from a corrosion perspective. You can only have it when there's a difference in potential, and that implies differential aeration at the edges of the voids. And that's the mechanism you get there, and that fits in with the patterns that we see. Now, notice, this is a self-contained mechanism. There is no external cathodes. The cathode is actually on the inside of the void while this thing is going. There is no ionic or electron flow through the concrete, which also doesn't fit what a lot of people have hypothesized. But if you do actually measure it, no, you don't measure it. You do measure concrete resistances. That doesn't tell you actually what's going on. There's no scale effect. This can be small or large. There can be multiples of them. And it can be represented by flaws, discontinuities at the still con concrete interface. It doesn't have to be the pits like we showed you before. It could be almost anything. And it's the primary oxygen reduction, it consumes oxygen. And if you think this is just us observing it, Francois and our, our league, 1999, pointed out exactly the same 
type of behavior. They didn't give you the model for what was happening. They just noted that after a little while, corrosion stops. And you think, yeah, well, that makes sense because that fits, in fact, the argument we're putting up here. So if you have very low permeability concrete, you get almost no initial corrosion and the long-term rate of corrosion is also, also very small. Just a few other things, because we now, if you like, taking a slightly broader picture. Um, the, one of the things that we don't talk about much is loss of concrete alkalis, and we think that's actually very important. There's a few other things, and I'll mention those as we go along. How am I going for time? Um, loss of alkalis. That is, in fact, what causes that long-term corrosion if you've got a good quality concrete. The alkali dissolution rate is actually very low, typically, but it is speeded up by chlorides, and that's been known for a long, long time. What evidence do we have for that? Well, those are samples we did in our laboratory. We mixed one lot up with a um, low heat cement or a sulfate resisting cement, and that's the picture you see on the left-hand side. That bar is virtually not corroded. The white concrete you see on the outside has got a pH of about seven, and that's where the alkali is leached out because we can do that now with modern analysis, we can show there's no calcium hydroxide or anything else much left in there. But the gray concrete you see in the middle, pH of about 12 or 11 thereabouts, and it's full of calcium hydroxide. And the white zones increase in size and the black zone or the dark zone decreases in size with longer term exposures. And we saw this first many, many years ago and didn't understand what we were looking at. But now that we can do all the analysis, it's very clear that the, al the alkalis are leaching out. Now, that's important. If you stick this under an electron microscope, you find that the outer concretes, the white concretes, uh, or, sorry, the original concretes is like the picture in the middle, but the concretes on the outside where the alkalis have leached out are much, much more permeable. And why? Is that relevant? Because this was low heat cement. And we know from Hansen, who makes this stuff, that when you first make the concrete, it's very dark. And then when you take the formwork off, after a few days, it turns light because it's oxidized. And when we checked out this light concrete in this picture, that was oxidized. That had oxygen enter into it. And it gets in because we've opened up the pores by the alkali is leaching out. Okay, there's some, a few other things that I think sometimes we mix up with chloride concentration. So field experience does show that hairline cracking can be very, very important. And I showed you this picture on the top right-hand corner already. That was one of the uh, Phoenix caissons. Between the pores, they didn't compact the concrete very well, and that's where the bars are corroding, and that's where you can see rust staining coming out. But we also see it in uh, the middle picture. That was from that. Um, um, uh, balustrade in, on the North Sea in, in Scotland. When we opened up some of those at hairline cracks, we got this massive amount of very, very localized corrosion. And you also found out when we measured the pH and so on that there wasn't much alkali left in there. And the reason is that you can then, if you lower the, the pH of the concrete, you then allow corrosion to occur but there's no oxygen. So you get ferrous chloride form. And ferrous chloride is very soluble. And it'll leach out through the cracks. When it gets to the outside, it'll oxidize and you get the rust stains. So that explains actually what's happened. And exactly the same in the bottom right-hand picture for those piles that came from that 900 pile bridge that I mentioned before. Most of them had no problem, but the one pile that did have a problem showed you the picture that you can see there with virtually the whole bar corroded away, but just around where the crack was. If you go about three, sorry, about 75 to 100 millimeters away from the crack, the bar is still completely intact. So you've got to just remember, be very careful. So I think the code rules need revision. We, sh we shouldn't just look at crack width because that's what came out of that old work by BB and so on, which was all to do with short-term um, exposures. And the idea of crack depth has been ignored. And I think that's actually a very important issue. Nothing to do with your critical chloride content, but it does relate to it.
Many years ago, we were asked to look at a, a highway bridge that came from Tasmania. It had multiple T uh, pre-stressed concrete T-beams, one of which you can see on the right-hand side. The vast majority, I can't remember how many, but they were okay. There was nothing to be seen, but there were just about three or four that had major problems with corrosion along the pre-stressing strands. We got those into our lab laboratory, we opened them up and we had a look. And the picture on the left side shows you the pre-stressing strands and on the top right-hand side where the red circle is, how much corrosion had occurred. I've drawn a green blob over it just to remind you where the size of the initial strands. And we didn't understand at that time what had happened, why this was going on. But if you think back, the grouting in that region around the bars would have been poor at the top, because that's typically what happens. The grout settles towards the bottom. And if you don't do it properly, you leave air voids. And that's exactly what would have happened there. There's now an explanation for what we saw. And some other bars there, the bottom right-hand picture shows you a similar sort of thing, but it's for a steel bar. They just didn't compact the concrete very well. And there are other cases we can point to that are, that are in the literature where people try and cook up um, arguments for what happens. But if you then ask the question, was the concrete well compacted? The answer is probably not, but no one records it. It just assumed that it had, has happened. Concrete cover must be adequate, we say. Well, what does that mean? Well, I've just been arguing we don't really need a chloride diffusion because we can make the concrete with, with chloride in it and so we don't need a cover. Uh, that's actually not true. We need it to reduce the inward diffusion of oxygen and the outward leaching of alkalis. That's a big problem. If we don't keep the alkalis in the concrete, we're going to have problems eventually. So that's why you need it. And there's some interesting things. I mean, we looked at an old reinforced concrete slab that had been out in the port region here in Newcastle for maybe 30 or 40 years. And uh, it was upside down and that's why the rust stains are going up. Um, but if you put it back the way it was, you find the cracking is along the bottom of the bars, not along the top, which is what you would expect under the critical chloride business, that the chlorides would have been higher at the top. Alkali aggregate reactions, I've nearly done, nearly finished guys. This is something that basically we, I didn't think about. And when we did those diagrams in the, that you see on the left there, I showed you those before, but I've now added two lines. The original without correction uh, lines are the ones I showed you before. And then we woke up one day and said, hang on, some of that data is from Norway. And we then found out in the sometime or other that Norway has a lot of problems with alkali aggregate reactions. So if we took the Norwegian data out, the curves went up, not only for the blast furnace slag cements uh, and the normal aggregates and so on, and because they, have, they don't have limestone aggregates. But dolomites, for example, are known to be particularly a problem with um, alkali aggregate reactions, and some limestones are, not all, but by no means all, and you see a similar type of behavior. And uh, Carmen and I had a bit of a discussion two or three years ago. We now know that in Spain, there are serious issues with alkali aggregate reactions. So in summary, the prime cause for corrosion initiation is the size of air voids at the concrete reinforcement interface. And the main issues that govern that are compaction effort and care and the workability has got to be high. So I'm all in favor of adding plasticizers because it works well, you get good compaction, good inter-surface inter behavior. And the trapping of air, of air reinforcement is a problem. It's less so for smooth bars, it gets worse for deformed bars and it's even worse for strands and pre stressed concrete, unless you're very careful. And there is the issue I've mentioned at all about bar spacing versus aggregate size, because we know from opening up concretes that uh, if the aggregate's too big, we get voids around the bars. So the other factors I've already mentioned, hairline features, cracks, hairline cracks and so on, big problem. Uh, adequate cover, you've got to have that around as well. And aggregate aggregate reactions important. But I can't really stress enough that for long-term corrosion, which is really what I'm interested in as a structural engineer, I don't really care too much about initiation. I want to know what's going to happen in the long term. Loss of alkalis is the big issue.
Okay, lots of lots of reading, and there's some more to come. Uh, the top ones in the slightly mauve or color uh, are open access, so you can just dial them up and read them. The ones in the middle, uh, you've got to be able to get a library or get a subscription or whatever. Uh, the Phoenix case and ones, I think, is a very interesting case to read because it just throws everything into good perspective. Uh, and if you want to run the science, you go and look at the last two, the ones in the blue box there. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rob, for your uh, clear presentation. I should remind the, the attendants that they can uh, present the questions in the Q&A and also in the chat and we will respond, we will try to respond uh, if you address to a particular presentation. In that case, please make your, your questions there. And I ask the rest of panelists if they like to have a, a Frank, you have a question. Yes, Rob, I'm very interested in the old structures like the Mulberry Harbour units, which I've inspected, Tungsense Tower, which I've inspected, Tungsense Tower particularly, is old concrete with coarse cement, which continues to hydrate. Very low quality concrete, 30 MPA. We, when we inspected it, we took the cores. We said, let's measure the permeability of this very ordinary concrete. Water will go through it like no one's business. And the permeability was very low. Uh, the strength was, in fact, quite high um, because it had 34 years of curing coarse grain cement. It occurs to me that in these old structures, it's very likely that all the original pores have now got filled up with um, some form of hydration product. And that, um, the, in fact, the porosity is not an issue. And um, the pH around the steel will all be high. Yeah, that's, that's all true. Um, there's one aspect about those, uh, the cases you mentioned they're almost certainly have made with high calcareous type of aggregate like limestones. Uh, yeah. the, the whole of the southeast coast of the UK or the southeast area of the UK and much of France uh, or the, the uh, channel part of France, the Belgium and so on, there's an incredible amount of limestone there. And you can see it in the White Cliffs of Dover. And we have shown, um, but we have, oh, now we haven't yet published, but we have shown that that makes a difference. And it actually increases the impermeability, if you like, or decreases the permeability. And that, there's also some very old work related to that. Um, just trying to think of the name of the guy, but he showed that the interaction between limestone and um, the cement type products, let's put it that way, um, there's a much better bonding between li yeah. uh, things like limestones than other aggregates. So you will immediately cut down the permeability. And I think that all fits. The transition zones are all a lot better as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, well, I think once I you start to put things into context. Here, here, Sorry, here's Frank. another reason why um, I, I believe we need to say that the critical chloride content might generally apply to most concretes with a normal uh, water cement ratio and normal voids. If we then exclude extraordinary things, we will come down to a much better critical chloride level distribution, which may fit many of these structures. Well, what's happening here locally, um, I've given this, this sort of talk uh, in more detail, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I think four times already in the last two years to the local concrete people. Uh, and I don't know why they keep asking me to come back and do it, but obviously they like something I'm saying. But one of the results is that the consultants are now beginning to say, well, uh, chlorides for older structures really isn't such a big issue. Just because you've got high chloride content doesn't mean anything. Go on, have a look at what the condition is of the bars. And then we come to a whole new ball game that it's much more difficult to inspect what is actually inside the concrete. And if you can show there's no reinforcement corrosion going on, you don't have a problem. Okay, we can continue the discussion later. <laughs> Sorry, because we need to go further. Thanks again, Rob. And, okay, my and, pleasure. Uh, it's very interesting that there are uh, different point of views and different interpretations on the on the facts that we have in front.